All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Kellis, pastor here at Berean Community Fellowship. Happy Easter. We've got a lot of visitors. Good to see you guys. A lot of families. Somebody, we got a family, and I hope they're watching right now. They're camping on Easter. They can't camp on Easter. Like, this is like, anyways, we love you guys. We miss you guys. Uh, so it's what we do for you guys who, who come here, who are part of this church. Consider this your home. Look around. If you see any, if you don't see somebody you expected to see, send them a message. Call them, send them a text, send them up on social media. Let them know that they're missed. It's really important, and it goes a long way. So what I want to do for the visitors, I apologize. I just have to get through some announcements. These are some things that might be of interest to you. If they are, you talk to me about them later. We'll get you guys plugged in and involved. But some things to going on with our church. So guys, on the 23rd, men, this is our men's breakfast. I think that's this coming Saturday. Men's breakfast, 8 o'clock, will be right here. Uh, I'll be making that. We're doing some like breakfast casseroles with some hot sauce. It's amazing. Um, but, but around 8 to 10 o'clock, that's what we'll be doing. And because right after that, the ladies are doing their ladies' brunch. They're not going to be meeting here at 1030, but at 1030, they're going to be at the Arnold's house, which is out 704. We can get you guys uh, the address. We'll, we'll spread that out. In fact, I, Callie, if you actually have it, maybe later, we'll just write it up here. Spoon Loy Road, yeah, it's right out 704. So I'll give you like the, uh, the way we give directions in Kentucky. You just go out about a mile or so, you're going to see a bunch of trees on the right. <laughs> and when you get to those trees, you've gone too far. You need to know, no. <laughs> they do that, and, and uh, it's, it's growing on me. And I, and, I, and I understand it now. It's actually, praise God, I, I know exactly where they mean. You know, go to that store that used to be there. Uh, <laughs> But I know, I know exactly where they're. <laughs> we, we've got a church. We actually have some, some locals here, and we love them to death. But we are a church of transplants. And for whatever reason, God has brought people to this community, and he's brought us together. Um, and so we're still learning some of the culture here. So that's the 23rd, men and ladies. We've got a uh, breakfast or a brunch. On, we're going to jump all the way to May. There might be actually, May is going to be pretty full. We've got uh, Mother's Day in May. Please help me. Uh, Remember? <laughs> Come on, guys. Look out for me. A couple years ago, I legit forgot to like the day before. So not only is that insulting to my mom, you know, but like I've got kids and we forgot something to do for Callie. So, you know, who I blamed, right? It's the kids. <laughs> you know, they should have reminded me. So I need help. I don't want to blame the kids again. But all right, so May, 4, May, <laughs> May 14th is a Saturday. Uh, we're going to be having a uh, really a concert, maybe a special night of worship. Some details will be coming out. Uh, really what it is, though, is Mark Corbett. I don't know. Does anybody here know Mark Corbett? He's been at our church, Callie. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, you know him, Kelvin, too. Kelvin's been around. Uh, of course, Ned and Bridget know him. He, he, he was a college student. Um, he was, uh, this is, has nothing to do with him leading worship, but he was the first kicker for the Lindsey Wilson football team. You know, it's a pr relatively new program. And because of that, I think he's still the all-time leading uh, scorer <laughs> uh, for, for the Lindsey Wilson team. But he was, because he, 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 he did it for four years. But he got saved while he was in college as a student here. Came, started coming to our Bible studies in the coffee shop at that time. Uh, we discipled him. He grew up, and he was our first uh, musician worship leader. Uh, he's from uh, Loretto, which is just uh, over here by... Lebanon, um, but now he's up working with uh, at the Ark uh, up in Cincinnati, and God's been just laying a bunch of songs on his heart. I know I still keep tabs with him and a, and a couple other kids, uh, and I invited him down here to share these songs that he's been writing. So he's going to share a bunch of songs on Saturday, and then we've actually uh, invited him to come uh, or stay the next day, and he's going to be our guest uh, musician uh, leading us in worship that Sunday morning. I think we'll have some other musicians playing with him. Um, but I, I can't wait for you guys to meet this guy. He loves Jesus. He's got a beautiful family. Um, can't wait to have him back in town. So, so that's May 14th and 15th. <laughs> and then on the 29th uh, is our Cinco de Mayo uh, celebration. Wait a minute. Cinco de Mayo, that means the 5th. Well, we can't pull it off the 5th. Uh, but you guys know every year we make some really good carne asada tacos. Uh, we eat out right here, and it's true, right? We get tons of people. And I'm like, I haven't seen you in a year. 
But they just like, they show up. because So we do it again because we want to see them. Um, but we, 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 do, we eat outside. Uh, I'm excited for this. So we'll get the menus and the recipes. We'll get all that distributed out. So that's going to actually end up being Sunday, May 29th, which is uh, our anniversary weekend. We're 16 years. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. It's coming up. And they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> say it again. What did you just say? You're raising the price. See, I thought you were going to say something sweet. <laughs> Guys, welcome. Uh, thanks for just uh, allowing us to banter and have fun. That's what it's about. We gather for Jesus. It's not to, to look a certain part. It's not to, you know, get some kind of tally marks on our to-do list for God. We, we, we meet this because we love each other and we love Jesus. And we want to encourage each other just, just to draw near to Jesus. So that's why we're here. Musicians are going to come up. They're going to lead us in some songs. We're actually going to have communion together. Uh, if, if you want to participate, you may. Uh, some churches actually have it reserved for those that are members or part of this church. We're open to it. It's between you and God. And so if you want to partake in that later, uh, we absolutely invite you and welcome you to do that. Uh, then we'll be getting into uh, God's Word, uh, and then we'll have a few more songs at the end. So that's kind of what you guys can expect this morning. So one last time, welcome. Let me pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. And we've got plans for this afternoon, plans for this week. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would help us be in this moment. Why is it that we're here? Lord, and whatever reason that, that you used and brought us here, um, Lord, reveal just that deeper, a deeper purpose. Lord, speak to us. Give us what we need. Meet us where we're at. Ask God that you would just overcome all of our distractions, all of our hard-heartedness, all of our worries and anxieties. Lord, just overcome those. Remind us that you are God, that you're for us, and you've done so much. That's the reason why we're celebrating today, Easter. Lord, you've done so much to give us access to you and hope for eternity. Lord, remind us of that wherever we are. Remind us of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth.
sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing it again. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. the weight of all our sin. Beneath the weight of all our sin, you bow to none but heaven's will. No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden great can hold you. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Singing, oh, death, where is your sin? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake. Come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away. Come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come away, come away. Come and rise up from the grave. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus.
Jesus came for to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, cause living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree. And took the nails for me, cause living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day, the grave. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now he's ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Rising again, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. Cause living he loved me, dying he saved me, and buried he carried my sins far away, blessing he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glory, living he loved me, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. God, we thank you and praise you for your finished work on the cross, for the life that you poured out for us so that we might live life through you. Thank you that you didn't just die to take our sins but you rose again, giving new hope, new life for all who believe in you, God. I pray that today our hearts would be ripe, ready for your word, that your Holy Spirit would convict and 
point out areas that we need to more fully surrender to you, God. Move in our hearts today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. There's a, a movie that came out in 2007. It's a Disney movie. I think it's Disney. It's called uh, Enchanted. You guys ever seen it? It's, it's about this, this animated princess who lives in this world where there's Prince Charming. There's, uh, you know, a, a, a wicked stepmother. Um, and she's going out, but somehow uh, the villain casts a spell, and this, this animated princess gets tossed into the real world, which is set at, like, downtown New York, 20, or I guess 20, uh, 2008 or 2007. The, really, the, it, it's a cute story. It's about this princess that finds true love from a, a person who lived in the real world who just didn't really believe in true love. And it ends that they lived happily ever after, right? We've seen that before. Well, that happily ever after lasted for about 15 years. Because now they're coming out with a sequel to this. It's coming out later this year called Disenchanted. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the plot somewhere it, it hints that this, this animated princess now in the real world becomes dissatisfied with her life, and she goes seeking for her own personal happiness. Man, the real life, though. I mean, for many of us, probably even just, if you just say happily ever after, you kind of get the, uh, the look or the feel, maybe the eyes roll. Yeah, right. You know, only in the storybook land. We've seen it before. Wouldn't it be true... I mean, let's just be honest. Wouldn't it be true to say that all of us, if not many of us, if not all of us, we've become dissatisfied with life? Let me just say it like this. There's, is there not areas that we all have that we wish things would have been different? We wish things would have worked out differently. Things that we wish we would have capitalized on. Maybe things we wish we would have said before it was too late. Maybe for some of us, it's more than just dissatisfied, but it's actually deeply disappointing. We're actually disappointed with the way things have turned out. There's something deep within us, guys. I, th I think deep within every human being that looks at the world and just has this sense, whether you've articulated it in your mind or not, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else out there. I, I hear it all the time. Like, I just, there's got to be something more. If, if this is it, well, then God sucks, you know, or something like that. Life is, I mean, think about life. Think about our experiences just even at work and in traffic. There's so much selfishness in, in the world. And selfishness, if gone unchecked, that leads to hatred and sometimes even violence. So there's so much pain in our world. There's suffering in our world. Many of us, again, I know many of your stories, you've experienced it, but it's everywhere. So much suffering, so much death, so much disease, bloodshed, that we look at like some of the reasons behind, you know, uh, we're going to talk about it maybe just a little bit later, but even just the, the invasion of Ukraine, all the, all the, all the bloodshed, like why? Why can't we just get along? I would say there is something deep within all of us that causes us so long for something more. And I mean, in life, though, maybe you guys have had a great life, and I hope you have. From time to time, we have glimpses of the better life. We have moments. Maybe they're moment, moments with our, with our kids, moments with our spouse, just moments uh, with a close friend. Maybe they're moments alone. <laughs> I thought all the mothers would give me an amen on that. <laughs> Moments alone, you know, but, but there's just these rich moments that are deep, they're soul satisfying. Praise God that we get these. But the truth is, they're just glimpses, aren't they? They're just moments. And even in those moments, how many of us, we, we just know 
It's not going to last. And so even just the joy that could, that could be, that we sense, it could be, we know deep in our mind, <sighs> Monday's coming soon. <laughs> That's my weekends, you know, I love, <laughs> I love my weekends, you know, Friday night, I'm so excited, we got so much potential, we're going to get so much done, Saturday we're doing it, come Sunday, it's like, oh, tomorrow's back to work, you know, and, but, that, but that's, that's it, right, these glimpses are just moments, that's all they are, it's only a moment and we know it won't last, but there's still something deep within us that longs for something more, so, so where does that come from? Where does that longing deep inside of our hearts, longing for something different, something better, something more, something more significant, where does that come from? I want to ask this question. Is it possible that we were actually created for something more? And because we were created for that more, until we get it, there's something in us that longs for it. That's what I want to talk about this morning because I believe there is. If you guys have your Bible... We're going to get into it. Really, we're not going through a verse-by-verse, kind of chapter-by-chapter like we normally do. I just kind of want to tell a story. We are going to get into Luke a little bit later. But if you go back to the very first page of the Bible, in the very first verse, we see something. Anybody know Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Go back to the very first verse. We are reminded, before there was anything, there was God. In the beginning, God. And while God was alone, he hadn't created anything, there was nothing else around, God wasn't lonely. And we've talked about this at length, but just as a reminder, we've learned that God lives in perfect relationship with himself. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the wondrous and mysterious doctrine of the Trinity, something that is, I'm glad it's beyond my full comprehension because that's God, but it's these three persons living in perfect harmony together. God the Father celebrating the Son, God the Son celebrating the Spirit, and the Spirit celebrating the Father. And you see the, actually the, the, the picture of the Trinity. You guys ever see the symbol? It's like this, over, and back up. The, the Spirit celebrating the Father and all for eternity, God loving and delighting and celebrating the relationships within the Trinity. And for hundreds of years, this is not something new, theologians have, ref, I guess, called or referenced to this relationship as the dance of God. Have you guys heard me use that phrase? This is the dance of God. And that's why I kind of drew it out here. Doesn't that look like, like some kind of ballroom step? You know, it's you know, to the right and then back around and then twirl. Maybe a little, uh, maybe not, I don't know. It, it's, it isn't though just that when we talk about eternal life, it isn't just the duration of life. When we talk about eternal life, come to Jesus. You can, have, you can live forever, have Eternal life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, it's not just the duration. We've talked about this, because for many of us, if it's just more of what I have right now, I don't want that. I don't want more of this. Life's tough. It's more of the quality of life. It's an eternal quality of life, the same quality of life that God has defined forever in that celebratory dancing relationship. Then God created. God created all that is, but when he created people, when he created us, he created us uniquely, uniquely in his image. And there's so many wonderful aspects about being created in the image of God. But perhaps I believe the most significant thing about us as human beings, separate from every other creation or, or, or created thing, is that we have the ability to join into God's dance, to join into relationship with Him, to actually be a part of that, uh, that, that dance, um, to experience that relationship, not only with Him, but, then, but because of that, with each other. It's probably the most soul-satisfying aspect of relationship with God. Uh, really, I, I, I look around, and I know many of you guys have experienced it, but it's it's what we offer when we share the gospel. It's what we say. You can be a part of this. Turn, give your life to Jesus. Follow him. 
This is what we're inviting people into. It's not inviting them into a church, inviting them into a religion. We're actually sharing the dance moves. You know, we're, we're like we're putting them on D- Jesus's dance card. You know, you get to be in relationship with God. That's crazy. Can I get it? That's crazy. It is. I mean, really, if you think about it, that that relationship of the Trinity we get invited into. God has made us to join into that dance. That's why he created us. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, it was referenced or referred to as a, as a paradise. We know this. It's a place where there was meaning, there was purpose, there was work and pleasure. It's a place where just there's this beautiful relationship. And we see that, that God would come and he would walk with them in the cool of the day. They would just go and they would talk. They, they, they were building and, and enhancing this beautiful relationship with God and, and people. The big risk, though, the big risk for people who are created in the image of God is to somehow think that maybe, maybe we can be God. Maybe we can be our own God. In fact, in my circumstances, I know what God says but I can explain why my way is better. And so the big temptation for people made in the image of God, we have a tendency to believe that we can be God. We can decide what's right and wrong. We can decide what's good and what's evil. I can be in charge of my own significance. I can be in charge of my own purpose, my own value. I determine anything and everything that belongs and refers to me. And so I'm going to live life on my terms I'm going to run the show. The idea of practically functioning as your own God, guys, it's not restricted to just atheists, though. Most religious people practically function as their own God. They do. They're, They're in charge of their lives in a very real and practical way. Most people that claim some level of spirituality, at the end of the day, practically speaking, they function as their own God. And the reason we do that is because, again, we're convinced that we know best, that we can find some kind of, we talked about it the other day, some kind of deal with God. We can find the deal that he hadn't probably thought of, but if we can, we can just barter, we can just create this deal with God, that we can do what we think is best, and, and he'll understand. We can be happier, we can be more satisfied, we can be more fulfilled when we are in charge. And that's actually the lie that Adam and Eve bought into. They rebelled against God. And when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they plunged the entire human race into darkness, into chaos, into sin. And the world today that we experience, that we have, is just the the results of all that. It's been spiraling out of control more and more and more. It's a result of the rebellion and the chaos from believing the lie that we could be our own God. People today, you know, it's interesting that people today, they, they, they want to blame God for the condition of the world. This is not, it wasn't God's design. That's not his dream that the world's like this. He created the paradise so that we could walk with him, so we could be with him in relationship. This, the world that we have today is a result of our rebellion against God, of not going and, and following his ways. As a matter of fact, when people on a daily basis continue to function as their own God, it just adds to the chaos. It just adds and adds and adds and defines the world that we're in. It's a mess. And we know that. We know it's a mess. And it's been a mess ever since Adam and Eve sinned. But before you actually even turn the page on Adam and Eve's rebellion, God makes a promise. He, he promises that somehow, some way, through the seed of a woman, that is through a, a, a human being, God would crush the head of the serpent and God would somehow make a way that we could come back into paradise, into this relationship with God. God would somehow bring life out of death. There's a song. He would make, he would make a garden out of a grave. There seems to be a hint when you guys read Genesis 3 that, that, that it might include some shedding of blood. But before we're even just halfway through the book of Genesis, we learn that the one who would become that seed it was actually going to be God himself. That God himself was going to come in the flesh to shed his own blood, to pay for the penalty and our inability to keep the covenant, to follow his rules. He was going to pay 
that price. He was going to live the righteous life we failed to live. And the rest of the Old Testament, I mean, really go through all these stories. They're just filled with pictures and, and metaphors and images and signposts and shadows. All these things that we say that we, we've talked about this too, guys. The things that foreshadow the coming of Christ. They were just declaring, hey, he promised it. He hasn't forgotten. This is what it's going to be like for, for generations. All these signposts, all the holy days, all the Jewish festivals, the Passover, the Sabbath, the law even, the temple, all the furniture in the temple, all these things had meaning. And they had purpose. They were shadows. They were, they were metaphors and pictures, signposts that God would provide what we need, a Savior. He raised up prophets just to make sure that people wouldn't miss these signs. He actually raised up prophets men and women who would be his mouthpiece, who would share the message to the people, telling them, you know, even, even prophecies that, 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 that he fulfilled to show them God hasn't forgotten. God is still going to keep his promise. He's, it's coming. Hundreds of predictive prophecies just about the Messiah himself. Perfectly, perfectly fulfilled in Christ. Some of these prophecies were, were so Radical. Again, God just didn't want anyone to miss it. So radical like a Jewish girl would become pregnant without ever knowing a man. That's not normal. That ought to get our attention. He never had a relationship with a man. A miracle. There, there, there would be a star over the place in, in Bethlehem that would guide the Magi to the location. That was a prophecy. It was fulfilled. That it would be in Bethlehem. That was a prophecy that angels would announce the arrival of the Messiah onto shepherds on a hillside. Fulfilling all these prophecies. Just, just, it's like a neon. It's like it took out an ad in the paper. Hey, I'm doing something here. Pay attention, pay attention. He even predicted that there'd be a crazy guy, crazy king named King Herod, who would get essentially jealous or intimidated by this coming new king that he would actually go out and kill all the newborn infants just to make sure that he didn't have a rival king. All of this predicted by the prophets. Not only that, God wanted to be so sure that we didn't miss it, this coming Savior, that he actually raised up a first century prophet as well. A crazy man, a wild guy, whose job was to announce the coming Messiah, the promised one. As a matter of fact, there, there's actually a moment uh, in history when John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The Savior had come. Now, so now that this seed of the woman, this, this God in the flesh has come to, to fix what we made wrong, we look at his life and we see his ministry it was filled with teaching, but it was filled with miracles. Not backroom parlor tricks that like anybody can do, like, oh, you guys see that? <laughs> That's a big deal right there. I, can, I can't even do it right. But, but he, he did like radical miracles in front of hundreds and thousands of people, showing them, hey, I am the dude. I am the guy God promised. He hasn't forgotten about you. This is a big deal. He, led, he fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of fishes. He stepped out of a boat and walked on water. He calmed a storm. Remember that? He calmed a storm. He rebuked it and it calmed down. So much that even his disciples were like, whoa, where is this guy from? Who is this man? Moments after moments, so spectacular that people everywhere were just rushing to see him. He made the lame to walk. He made the blind to see. He even raised people from the dead. Not in secret, but in front of hundreds and thousands of people. It was so much more than this, though. I mean, in the first century Roman Jewish culture, there were those who were untouchables. You guys ever heard of that phrase? Just, just so, such, a, such a low caste. Maybe they, you know, they had uh, some kind of disease or just something that, that nobody would, would give them the time of day. They were untouchable. They were removed from society. They were failures, losers, misfits. Many of these people 
who, who had never experienced maybe human touch in years, Jesus went to them. He touched them as God in the flesh. He, 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 he went straight for them. Think about just, the, just the, the message that itself gives us. He loved them. He spent time with them. He talked with them. He ate with them. Nobody was out of reach from this God in the flesh. Nobody was off limits. Everybody had access to him. If it's possible that, that these sinners, these misfits, these losers had access to God, I mean, just think about the hope then that would give all of us that we could have a relationship with him. Guys, I think there was something deep in their souls that, be, that started to just come alive when Jesus really singled them out and approached them. I mean, he promised them that he'd be the bread of life to those who are hungry. He said that he was, he was the, the living water to those who are thirsty, who just are wanting more, who are hungry for more, who are thirsty for more. And for maybe the first time in their lives, these sinners, these misfits, these losers dared to hope, dared to believe that maybe there was something more even for them. These, the, all these sinners, these misfits and losers, they couldn't get enough of Jesus. It was so much that even threatened the, the religious leaders of that day. They started realizing, these religious leaders, that they were losing power. They were losing their position. They were losing their following. And they couldn't control this message of grace that, God, that Jesus was teaching. So they got together with the Romans and they started conspiring. This teacher needs to die. We can't have any more of this. Jesus called them out. Right? He, he, he confronted the religious leaders. He called them self-righteous hypocrites. He rebuked them for putting so much of a, of a man-made tradition on people. That just is burdensome. And some of us, we've experienced that. We've experienced the man-made traditions that, that just put a burden on us in church. But he, these people couldn't get enough of God, especially when he started just just separating himself and separating God from the religious activities. But so these religious, these religious leaders, they understood Jesus was winning. He was taking the hearts of the people, and they determined he had to die. You can't really miss the irony. I mean, think about it. God of the universe, he takes on human flesh, right? He's coming. He, he's, he's, he's among us. He's walking around. But it's not the secular Romans that opposed him. It was the religious leaders that opposed him. Jesus was taken through a series of illegal trials. They brought against trumped up charges, false witnesses. They eventually condemned him to die on a, on, on a cross. He was, he was nailed on the cross. Again, false charges. But the reason which he died was real. We actually uh, had our family watch The Passion of the Christ it's recently. It's so graphic. And I can't remember. I forgot how graphic it was. But it, it was tough. It was tough to watch it. And I'm bawling the whole time. There was a historical man with his the, 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 a real experiences that they caught somewhat on, on, on film. Just amazing. It's very real. And it's not that his plan went bad. It's not that his plan, you know, like he had to turn to plan B. This was the plan from the beginning. It was the fulfillment of the promise that he made all the way back when Adam and Eve rebelled. That somehow God would become the seed of a woman and man would, as a man, would shed his blood to pay for the sins of the world. That was his plan all along. Some people sometimes, maybe you've been asked this. Why did Jesus have to die? Right? I mean, why couldn't God just forgive and just say it's okay? I don't really understand that question. I mean, really, the, the, the question that that, that is, it, it's a question that's asking, why, why couldn't God just, just pretend that nobody sinned? Right? Wouldn't that be so much easier? Think about this. We were, again, we, 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 I mentioned it earlier, we're shocked by the invasion of Ukraine. I mean, we're, some of us, and I've heard conversations, we had a, a great conversation about it last night with our international students. We're just an outrage. How, how, can, how can this be? You know, this, this bubble of peace that we've had for, you know, since World War II, essentially, world peace, 
is, it's just popped. We're, we're in war. We're in turmoil again. So the, we're asking the question, well, well, what do we do now? What's the way forward? How can I help? What should the United States do? What should NATO do? All these things. What's right to do? And there's lots of options on the table. But one option that is not on the table, it's not on the table, we cannot pretend it didn't happen. You can't pretend it didn't happen. It did happen. There are people who are dead now. There are cities that have been reduced to rubble. There are people who are maimed. There are people who are injured. There's, this is a country that will never be the same. One thing you cannot do, the option that is not on the table, is just pretend it didn't happen. In the same way, guys, we have all sinned. We have rebelled against God. We've made a mess of God's world. One option that is not on the table is just to pretend it, doesn't, it didn't happen. He's God. And there's justice. A payment must be made. God could condemn us for our sin. That would be justice. But God has offered an alternative plan. The alternative plan is because Jesus was sinless, he can absorb upon himself all of the sins of the world. He, he could take upon himself the wrath of God. He could shed his blood for sin. He, he could pay our debt. He could make a, atonement for our sins. And the prophets predicted that the Messiah would be executed. They actually predicted that. Jesus himself says, I have come to give my life for a ransom for many. This was the plan all along. It was the fulfillment of a promise that he made thousands of years ago so that Jesus on the cross could die. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. He wasn't buried in some remote, some obscure place that nobody knew about. It was a rich man's tomb that, that lent it to him. Everybody knew where it was. There's no confusion over where the tomb was. And maybe, again, imagine that, that when he was put into the tomb, when Jesus was buried, all the hopes, all the dreams of his followers were probably buried with him. Right? You, that would make sense. This is the man. This is our leader. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> we'll find someone else, you know. They could, have, they could have possibly have understood what was going on. For the first time in their lives, they had this sense of hope. They had a sense of future. Their souls were becoming alive because of their interaction with this person, this relationship they had with Jesus. But all of that buried with Jesus. Jesus even had told them, though, straight up, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. The Son of Man must be raised up. He told them straight up that he would rise from the dead. Whatever they understood that to mean, they absolutely didn't expect it to happen on Easter. They were, they were down. They were out. So I want to read to you what happened. This is where we're going to get into Luke. I want to read to you as they recorded it in Luke. But on the, We're going to have it up here if you don't have it. But on the first day of the week... At early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the Mary the mother of James, also, the other woman with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Because no question about it, the tomb was empty. Jesus 
had risen. Now, understand, 2,000 years later, I mean, there's critics, right? I know maybe even in this room there's skeptics. We would just laugh at the idea that someone could be resurrected, that this risen Christ, I mean, come on, right? We're a modern people. We have science and the meta world. We have sophistication. We're scientific. This doesn't happen with no evidence other than simply belief. I mean, knowing that science says normal people don't do this, normal people don't rise from the dead, the critics dismiss it. And I get it. I get it. Science, I mean, I, I stand back. I, I used to have a shirt. Stand back. I'm about to do science. I mean, my brother's a, a science teacher, you know, so like that makes me an expert. Uh, <laughs> I get it, though. I, I can't agree more. I, I, I get the point. Jesus was no ordinary man, though. And science can't prove that he didn't rise from the dead. It's called a miracle. Defying science, defying reason, he would rise from the dead. A miracle that, that validated his claim, I am the promised one. I've done what God said from the very beginning he would do. I would be the Savior, the long-awaited Savior to the world. I understand, again, science, I'm pretty much sure I read it in a, a scientific journal that Jewish girls don't become pregnant without knowing a man. I'm pretty sure that's the way it works, or studies that show that. But it happened. And lots of people were there to, to mark it. It was a miracle. And as far as I know, ordinary men don't walk on water. As far as I know, ordinary men and women cannot command the wind and they can't command the sea to be quiet. Ordinary men can't do all these miracles that, again, thousands of people testified and witnessed in the life of Jesus. And if he can do all these things that ordinary men can't do, why can't he do something else ordinary men can't do? So people today, we laugh, we scoff at this claim, but nobody was laughing in Jerusalem. When it happened, nobody was laughing. This miracle of him coming back to life rocked this city. Now Jerusalem was filled with critics. There were people there who wanted to kill him. They wanted to stop this movement. But there was nothing they could do to dispute this claim of a resurrected Jesus because he revealed himself to Hundreds of people. It spread. It was a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. He appeared to his friends. He appeared then to his followers. He talked with them. He ate with them. He spent time with them. He actually appeared to 500 people at one time. That's more people that witnessed, more people than wit that were there when Abraham Lincoln was killed. But we don't dispute that. There wasn't 500 people in that, that, that 500 people. This rocked that city. And for 40 days he was with them before he ascended the Father. There was plenty of skeptics who probably would have gone to these people and tried to get them to trip up their story, but they couldn't do it. Roman soldiers, religious leaders, all the persecutors of Christianity, based on the evidence, started believing. It, lives were changed. In Jerusalem alone, in just a couple of months, there were over 10,000 people that started believing. Now what happened? I thought their leader was killed. Something happened. That movement didn't die. It blew up because they saw this resurrected man. The evidence was so compelling. The message of the resurrected Christ, it started spreading. It went from Jerusalem to Samaria, all around the Mediterranean, all around the world. And here we are today. 2,000 years later, this message of a crucified and risen Christ is still spreading to every continent, to every culture. Every country actually has a witness. We're trying to get down to every tribe, every people group. And I think we're down to about 1,100 people groups, tribes, remote places in the world that still haven't heard. But we're, we're, we're getting the word out. This weekend alone, just think about it, thousands of people have walked through doors just like that. Maybe they closed after them and they didn't have big trucks driving by, but doors just like that. And people are bearing 
witness to this resurrected Jesus. People whose lives have been radically changed by an encounter with Jesus. I shared my testimony yesterday with our international students. God changed my life. I'm not going to get into all of it now, but if, for those who do know, I'm a changed man. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. I'm just way different because God met me and saved me. Because God offered his son to make payment for my sin. The work finished on the cross. And Jesus, and we saw this in the movie, and I was really hoping my girls would catch this. We actually, I don't mean to pause it, but I, but I explained it. When Jesus, on the cross, he says, it's finished. It's accomplished. That's a word, I can't pronounce it in, uh, in the Greek or the Hebrew, is teletelai, something like that. Yes. Does anybody know? It means paid in full. It's done. It's accomplished. I've done what I've come to do. Paid in full for those who by faith are willing to believe. That Jesus died for my sins. To those who are willing to believe that he died for your sins and that he's your savior. Guys, when we talk, I mentioned it earlier, you know, this is, the, this is what we offer. This is what we share. This is the gospel. You don't have to go out and get religious. I mean, I, Callie dressed me like this. I wanted to wear cutoffs. I wanted to wear my pirate pants, just d- dicky shorts that I cut triangles into it. Because it's not about religion. It's not about that. You don't have to go out and get cleaned up and act good. God offers you salvation freely by grace through faith on the basis of what he did. If you just by faith choose to receive it. God offers you forgiveness of your sins. And for many of us, that haunts us. We have got so much guilt, so much shame. It's His payment was enough. It's finished. It's accomplished. Forgiveness of sins. But more than that, he invites us into the dance that he has been dancing for all of eternity. He invites us into relationship with this holy God who wants to know us and walk with us, be our friend, our confidant, be our Lord, our Savior. Just, just the, the intimacy that is this soul satisfying, this world will never, never, never match. So in Christ, He's promised us that one day we will live with Him for all of eternity. That's starting now. seems to me Easter Sunday is a day to celebrate. It is. It's a day to celebrate. Happy Resurrection Day. This day changes everything. In fact, I don't know why. I mean, mean, the the community gets into it. You know, there's egg hunts and all sorts of stuff. But for the most part, it's not even close to Christmas. Even the decorations. We didn't put any decorations. But guys, Easter is what it's all about. It's why he came. To die and to rise again. So that we could be brought near. We're going to, in just a minute, have communion. The musician's going to come up. They're going to just play some songs. And then we're going to maybe sing some songs even after. But communion, Scripture says, kind of a warning for communion. It says, so then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. We've explained that to me. That really, you got to think about your life. Are you still trying to earn God's favor? Are you still trying to, to clean yourself up, to act the part before you can have a relationship with God? If that's you, that's an unworthy manner. Because you have forgotten why He came in the first place. It's because we couldn't do it. So as we go through this, we think about it, we meditate on it, and we remember that is nothing that we could do. It's all about what he accomplished. Isaiah 53, verse 3, says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took 
up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all. Say that with me, guys. We all. Okay, let's try that again. We all. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, I said it just a minute ago, but when he was on the cross, he uttered these words, it is finished. It's a legal term, paid in full. Stamp, done, no dispute. And the sacrifice actually makes it possible for us to draw near. Something that is just absolutely foreign and crazy to first century religious, religious people and even religious people today. The fact that we could draw near to God. If you guys are going to be taking communion, I, I, I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and come up now. I'm going to say a little bit more in just a minute, but if you're, if you're going to participate, go ahead, come, grab the unleavened bread, grab the grape juice. And if you, you notice this plate up here, this plate is, is a Seder plate. When we take communion, we, really for the most part, American Christendom, Western culture, our communion is a, a watered-down version of the Seder meal. The Seder meal is, is the Passover meal. It's what the Israelites, really it's a meal that they did every single year from the very first Passover. They'd get together, and instead of maybe telling the story of, of how God rescued them and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They all knew the story. What they did, they, they would engage in this conversation and they would look at this plate and each of those items, and they would, each of those items represents an element of the story, a reminder of what God has done for his people. And when they're in the Seder meal, they go through that order, they drink different cups. This is what Jesus would have been doing with his disciples the night he was crucified. The night he was seized and arrested, tortured and crucified. He, he just got done having the Seder meal with his disciples. They would have gone through this story and they would have, they would have shared it. They would have sang. We, we actually did this uh, Friday night. We had a night of worship. We had communion Friday night. And I shared that there's a, a thing on the table, part of, part of this meal, called the afikomen. Do you guys remember that? The afikomen. It's, it's three of these uh, matzah breads, and they're wrapped up in a cloth. And part of the, the service, this has been done for thousands of years, part of the service, the, the meal together, they take the cloth, they open it up, and they take one of the pieces of, of matzah. They take one of the three out. Pardon me. They crush it. They, they take that crushed piece, they wrap it back up in the cloth, and then they go and they hide it. We actually did that Friday night. And that piece that was broken was wrapped in cloth, was put away. And part of the service that they've, for thousands of years, they would go off and later in their meal together, they'd go off and they'd find that piece that was broken and they'd bring it back and it'd be a celebration. To be honest, when you ask them why they do that, they don't know. They don't know, but it's what they've always done. So we broke that bread on Friday and it's been hiding. But it's been long enough, hasn't it? It's time to come back. Kids, do you guys see? Where's that broken cloth with the broken? Where is it? Can somebody find it for me and bring it back? Usually there's five bucks 
or 20 for the kid who finds it. It's hidden. Who sees it? We need Jesus back. So <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? Can you bring it back? Can I get a treasure? You did great. They bring it back. And it's just so beautiful. It's just this picture, this, this broken bread. Don't want to catch it on fire. This matzo bread that's pierced, that's striped. It's got to be pierced. It's got to be striped. When you ask why, it's because that's the way it's always been. But we know. We just read. He was pierced for our transgressions. He took stripes. His body was broken for us. Jesus actually in that, in that meal, remember he said, this is my body, broken for you. It's amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. He would have taken this, this bread right there. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. It's like he finally showed them. They've been doing this their whole life. This is me. This is another thing God has been doing for thousands of years to tell us he hasn't forgotten about us. He's going to fulfill his promise. And I can just see like maybe even afterwards, their eyes just wide open. I get it. I get it now. There's a saying I used, to, I used to say, God never said we could. We can't, and God never said we could. He can, and he always said he would. And so we're going to take communion. We're going to remember what he accomplished. We're going to remember what it says about us and our inability. We're going to remember what it accomplished. And because of what it accomplished, we're going to remember what's available to us. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this reminder. It's been around for thousands of years. I ask God that it would just be real in this moment. That we would see your initiative to make yourself known to us. So that we would believe and join it to the dance forever. Lord, thank you for your body that was broken. We eat it in remembrance of you. Go ahead and let's eat the bread. It symbolizes his body. That was broken. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, in Genesis it hinted there's going to have to be blood shed. The, 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 the crime, the consequences of our rebellion against God demands bloodshed. The righteousness He requires of us that we could never, ever produce, He provided. The blood that we would have had to have spilt, He spilt for us. We're going to drink now in remembrance of him. Symbolizing the blood that was poured out for the remission of sins. Let's drink. This is a, a time to celebrate. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to stand up with me in just a minute. We're going to sing some songs. Clap, put your hands up, whatever you got to do. I don't know how you celebrate. Do this. <laughs> celebrate. Celebrate. There's good news. Today's the good news of the risen Lord. I love you guys. Thank you for joining me today. I hope our day, our, our day is filled with just gratitude for all the moments and the glimpses that we get to experience now. But don't lose hope. 
there's a coming a day where there will be no more sorrow, no more tears. We get to be with him in that dance, unrestrained forever and ever and ever. It's coming. Let's sing. What can wash away my sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Precious is a foe. Oh, precious is the foe. God makes me white as snow. No other thoughts I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing nothing. The blood of Jesus.
flood. He plunged me. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Praise God. <laughs> Y'all have a blessed Easter. Wait, 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 wait. That was so good. And I know I told you to close, but I forgot something other. Have a seat, guys. So, so there's this wonderful message of the gospel. And I shared earlier how it's just it's spreading. We actually have somebody in our fellowship now who is answering the call to go out and share the message. And I wanted to give him opportunity to share what he's planning on doing, uh, just give you a little bit of, a, uh, of an update of, of what's Progressing, I'm not going to just steal your thunder. Come on up. This is Dan Holder, he, and he is going on a mission trip. You want to use that one right there? Can everybody hear me? No, use the mic. Use the mic. We got it. No, you have to squat down. No. <laughs> All right. Um, so like Kella said, my name is Daniel Holder. Uh, me and my family go to this church. If we haven't met, um, I love this church, and one of my favorite things about this church is that I get to ask you guys for money, and I don't feel guilty about it. Um, <laughs> but um, like Kella said, um, this summer um, I'm going to, on an internship with Go Ministries, a mission organization in the Dominican Republic. Um, I was able to serve with them last year, and so I was Sam and Taylor as we went. Um, and just a, uh, just a defining experience for me, and I was just so captivated uh, by the work they were doing there. You know, sometimes you meet uh, a spirit-filled person and you get, to, you get to know them, and it's just like life comes out of them. Um, that as you just get to know them, everything they do is gold, right? Like just God is in it. And then sometimes you meet a spirit-filled family uh, where it's just like a whole group of people are like that. And just it's even more life, and it's just even more wonderful. And then sometimes you come into contact with a spirit-filled organization. And uh, my impression of Go Ministries is that that's just what it felt like. Uh, just to join them in the work they're doing. It just felt like to just genuinely join God in the work he was doing in the Dominican Republic. Uh, so whatever you think missions should be, chances are they're doing that. Uh, one of their goals is to plant 10,000 uh, or 1,000 churches in the next 10 years. They do needs-based ministry. They have a medical center. Um, they do VBS for kids. They do construction projects, uh, just different community service. They're building a seminary and a vocational training center. Uh, just so many different things, and I, I'm so impressed by what they're doing, and uh, was some of the reasons I wanted to join them in those things. Uh, so as I went last year, I was just so inspired and so much wanted to go back and join them again, and am now going on uh, the internship with them. And so I wanted to share that with you guys, just my excitement about that, and just all the exciting work they're doing there. And just to humbly ask, um, if any of you would like to donate, um, you can either talk to me and I can tell you how to do that. Um, you can donate through a link online. You can mail it to go directly. Um, and I'm about halfway fundraised right now, and my goal is to get everything again by the end of this month. So if you guys have any questions about that for me, what that would look like, um, or how you would do that, um, it'll be a five and a half week trip for me. I'll be there from May 27th to July 5th, I think. And they told me you know, I'll be doing um, anything from helping the weekly trips, from construction projects, um, to um, helping um, different VBS schools, to, um, and they also made sure to tell me at the front, your job is also to do whatever we tell you to do. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be doing a lot of that, hopefully. But if you guys have any other questions, um, let me know. And just like Kella said, I'm just so excited for this opportunity to be able to um, just see Jesus alive in the world uh, and just see Jesus actually working in the world. Um, in a tangible way, in a way that actually changes people's lives. So thank you all. Cool. Thank you for sharing. So yeah, make sure you guys talk with him. We're going to be having a, a send-off uh, Sunday. Uh, probably we'll just figure out whatever the last Sunday is or here, and uh, we'll lay hands on you and pray for you uh, at that time. So uh, I love you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, go give him some money. Uh, <laughs> but, but have a good day. Love you guys. We're dismissed.